Hey A pushers, so this is um, period three's final review frame, frame number four, um, but this is video number seven. All right, so uh, last we left, uh, George Washington delivered his famous farewell address in which he warns against political parties as well as uh, foreign entanglements. So political parties those are, and, and alliances with the Europeans, those are the two things that are going to essentially plague the John Adams' administration. So Washington served his two terms, and then John Adams, former VP, will run and win against Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson will then win the next presidency. So this frame is the Adams-Jefferson frame, and the big issue here, the Federalists versus the Republicans, this is a first party system, and this is going to plague both of their administrations. All right, so um, let's pick up with uh, Jay's Treaty first. So we know that we signed a treaty with the English called Jay's Treaty um, that really did upset the Republicans because it seemed to favor the elite, the Federalists. Um, but it did establish a strong commercial trade agreement with the British. So we began extensively trading with the British, which of course is going to put us at odds with the British's arch nemesis, the French. So we're going to be starting to have some trouble with the French, particularly on the high seas uh, in the Caribbean. We also, you may recall, signed a treaty under the Washington administration with the Spanish. Um, and that was called Pinckney's Treaty. And both of these treaties essentially created, uh, at least for a short period of time, um, a decent relationship with the English and the Spanish. Uh, realized that uh, there is still an ongoing struggle for North America. The British, the French, the Spanish, and the Americans and the natives are all struggling for control of North America. All right, so with Jay's Treaty, um, we're going to start trading extensively. Ships are going to go uh, headed for Britain to trade, and this is going to put us at odds with the French. And what will commence, essentially, is a quasi-war with the French. Quasi meaning it's an undeclared war. So as we're continuing to trade with the British, uh, the French begin to impress U.S. ships and sailors. And that means they would not only take U.S. Uh, sailors, but also a lot of the cargo on board U.S. ships. And this, of course, is going to put us at odds with the French. Now, in an attempt to try and diplomatically resolve this ongoing problem between the uh, U.S. and France, President Adams is going to uh, attempt diplomacy. And so he's going to send a bipartisan commission to uh, France to try and negotiate a resolution to this ongoing problem. So the reason that he sends a bipartisan underscore uh, commission is because there is con constant conflict between the Federalists and the Republicans. So in an attempt to try and placate both sides, because the last couple of treaties, right, was so bipartisan, he's going to send um, two Federalists and a Republican to represent the United States uh, in negotiations with France. So the three Americans go to France and they meet with the French foreign minister, a guy named Talleyrand. But Talleyrand, before they even begin open discussions, Talleyrand demands a bribe. Um, and, uh, and of course the Americans, the three Americans reported back to Adams and said, hey Adams, guess what? In order to even begin negotiations with the French, we've got to pay the French government the new French government, right? This is the French government that is part of the reign of terror. We've got to pay them a, a bribe. And so Adams sees this as an opportunity um, to perhaps draw some sympathy for the American cause against the French. So John Adams is going to take this report sent by uh, the three Americans, uh, blot out uh, the names, replace it with XYZ, and um, publish it in American newspapers. And this is going to gain a lot of support for war with France. So for the next two years, the U.S. is engaged in an undeclared war with France, a, a war on the high seas, a, a naval war, largely in the Caribbean. And so uh, the result of this quasi-war with the French is um, essentially a ceasefire. It's called the Treaty of Montefortain. 
and it's going to establish a new commercial uh, arrangement with the French. And much like we saw with Jay's treaty, uh, the Treaty of Montefortain is going to be very popular with the merchants, with the more elite, in other words, the Federalists. So this is also another example of that bipartisanship, and that under Washington and now Adams, the country is for the elite and not for the common man. Okay, so with the conflict with France ended, um, the Federalists gain majorities in, um, in Congress in 1798. So they feel pretty emboldened. And one of the things they're going to do in order to uh, essentially make themselves a Federalist, the one political party, uh, is to silence the Republican opposition by passing legislation known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. So the Alien Act placed obstacles for foreigners becoming citizens. Um, in other words, uh, immigrants who are coming into the country largely are going to be Republican, so let's silence that vote. More significantly is the Sedition Act. This allowed the government to prosecute um, people who spoke out against the government. Um, that was treasonous activity. So it made it illegal to speak or write anything that criticized the president or Congress. So uh, John Adams, when this bill gets put on his desk, and of course this was largely led by Alexander Hamilton, uh, John Adams is a little skeptical at first, but when when Hamilton said, look, we're not going to use it for the common man. We're going to use the Silence um, uh, Sedition Act in order to silence top Republican um, voices. So reluctantly, John Adams signs the act. So, of course, um, they did use, the Republicans, or the Federalists did use the uh, Sedition Acts and had many uh, people arrested. Of outspoken Republicans. And so in an attempt to try and get rid of this piece of national legislation, we're going to see that the Republicans are going to attempt to do, to get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts through where they believe power should lie, and that is at the state level. So this is using Locke's compact theory. And Locke, John Locke's compact theory said the federal government was formed by a compact among the states and possessed only certain delegated, right? The federal government possessed only certain delegated power. When the national government extends its power, it breaches the contract and therefore states could nullify these national laws. All right, so Thomas Jefferson and James Madison go before various state um, legislatures and um, propose what has become called the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. And this basically is uh, legislation at the state level that would, that would nullify um, national legislation. Unfortunately, only Virginia and Kentucky successfully passed these nullification laws against the Alien Sedition Acts because, again, most state legislatures were made up of elite. And all of these policies under the Federalist Administration is to cater to the elite. So um, the Alien Sedition Acts, however, were vastly unpopular among the American public. And as a result of the fact that we could not get the Alien Sedition Acts overturned, the American public will react. The only way that a democratic American public can go to the voter polls. And in the election of 1800, we see a sweep, a sweep for the Republicans upsetting right, the, uh, the Federalists. So John Adams turned out to be a one-hit wonder, a one-termer because of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, instead, in the 1800 election, Jefferson will win, known as the Revolution of 1800. And this was because of popular support against the Alien and Sedition Acts. So it's known as revolution because it's viewed as a victory for the common man, saving this republic from the tyranny of the elite. So in this conflict, this ongoing power battle between the Federalists and the Republicans, not only did the Republicans win the executive branch, but also the legislative branch. They took both houses of Congress. Only branch the Federalists had left were the, was the judicial branch. And so they're going to hold on by, uh, by their fingernails. And so they're going to do a series of things that are going to greatly empower the judiciary branch, which, 
at the time was not really an equitable branch um, in our republic. So um, in, the lame ducks, in the lame duck period, uh, the Federalists are going to pass the Judiciary Act of 1801, and this creates more judge positions all over the U.S. And of course, John Adams, the lame duck president, is going to be able to nominate uh, people to all of these new positions, meaning naming more Federalists to these new positions. And the way it worked is that judgeships um, were given through a process that was administered by the Secretary of State. At the time, um, the Secretary of State was John Marshall. And so he had to sign, seal, and deliver all of the judge positions to the various candidates. Now, he did this for hundreds of them, but with the exception of a few midnight appointments. So Mulberry versus Madison is an example of a Supreme Court case in which the Federalists are going to attempt to usurp power by um, emboldening the judicial branch. So the way it worked was um, it, it, it's all based on a piece of legislation passed uh, early in our country's history, uh, right when uh, George Washington takes office in 1789, there was a piece of legislation passed that uh, called the Judiciary Act of 1789, and in it, it it kind of outlined the power of um, original jurisdiction and writs of mandamus, all of this kind of stuff. So Marbury wanted Madison. Oh, I guess I should probably explain this. So John Marshall doesn't deliver a few midnight appointments. Uh, entering office, of course, is Thomas Jefferson with his Secretary of State, James Madison. So James Madison receives this note from John Marshall, a former Secretary of State, and it says, could you please deliver these final appointments? I've signed them, I've sealed them, I just need you to deliver them. Madison, of course, says, no way. So Marbury was one of those midnight appointments, and so Marbury petitions the court and basically what Mulberry wants is for the current Secretary of State, James Madison, to issue him his judgeship through a writ of mandamus. Um, Madison refuses to deliver the appointment, and so Mulberry brings this before the U.S. Supreme Court. Because according to the Judiciary Act of 1789, these kinds of things have original jurisdiction in the Supreme Court. All right. So the Supreme Court, though, now is under John Marshall, the former Secretary of State. Turns out John Marshall was one of those appointments that was made, and he is now Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And Marshall will rule against Marbury. Now, you can say, wait, what? How did that happen? Because he said that the Supreme Court cannot issue a writ of mandamus because according to the Constitution, it does not have the uh, original jurisdiction uh, in this case. Uh, Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution says, In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. So no, the Judiciary Act of 1789 is in conflict with the Constitution. Therefore, the Judiciary Act of 1789 is unconstitutional. And uh, the Supreme Court has just established the power of judicial review. And by establishing the power of judicial review, it has greatly emboldened itself as a relatively equitable branch in our three-branch system. All right. Um, so let's move now to um, Jefferson's major issue, and that is the Louisiana Purchase. Now, you may recall that um, the French had given, uh, given after the French and Indian War, the French gave Louisiana territory to the Spanish. But when Napoleon becomes ruler of France, Napoleon has grand illusions of ruling the world. So he wanted, Napoleon wanted to restore French power in the New World. So he purchased Louisiana from the, uh, from the Spanish. Um, and so it's called the Treaty of San Ildefonso. So the French regain the Louisiana Territory. And when the French regain it, everybody's like, wait a minute, what about 
Pinckney's Treaty, we had an agreement for usage of the Mississippi River under Pinckney's Treaty. So um, there's an ongoing problem with this. And Thomas Jefferson is aware of this problem. Meanwhile, again, the French were all about dominating now the New World. Napoleon wants to rule the world. Um, and he planned on uh, sandwiching, essentially, uh, the New World by, by uh, you know, taking Louisiana territory and then launching an attack of the United States from the Atlantic. And then a land um, invasion from Louisiana. But then something happens. The, this little Caribbean nation known as Haiti... Um, was a was a French territory. It was um, a largely sugar plantation, and of course, it had a huge number of slaves. And uh, a former slave by the name of Toussaint Louverture is going to successfully lead a slave rebellion in French Haiti. And uh, the French, of course, are going to send troops to Haiti to put down this rebellion because he wanted to use Haiti as uh, as a stepping stone into the Americas to launch an invasion of the United States. But the problem was that things are not going well in the uh, in Haiti. The French troops are losing to uh, the to the Haitian slaves, and so as a result of this, we'll see that Napoleon now finds himself in a very different position. Without Haiti, he can't launch an invasion of the United States, and therefore the Louisiana Territory is kind of pointless at this point. So, uh, so. Unbeknownst to Jefferson, though, any of this is happening. All he knows is that there's been a violation of Pinckney's Treaty. So he sends a diplomat, Robert Livingston, to negotiate for the purchase of New Orleans. Maybe if we purchase New Orleans, then we have control of the Mississippi River. So Livingston goes to France to meet with Napoleon. And so Livingston thought he was clever. He says, hey, I'm going to offer to pay for all of Louisiana territory for what I would have bought New Orleans for, and hopefully we can negotiate down to New Orleans. But lo and behold, Napoleon agrees to accept Livington's initial offer of purchasing all of Louisiana for $15 million. And so Livingston's in a pickle because he doesn't have the authorization to do it, but if he waits to get Thomas Jefferson's approval, then the erratic Napoleon could change his mind. So Livingston decides to just pull the trigger and he's going to do it. And here are the terms of the Louisiana Purchase. U.S. will pay $15 million to the French. U.S. will give the French certain exclusive commercial privileges in the Port of New Orleans. The U.S. will give residents in Louisiana the same rights and privileges as other Americans. And the boundaries. Those are not real clear. Those are going to have to be decided later. So when Livingston gets back to the United States and meets with Jefferson and tells him what just happened, Jefferson is like, oh, wow, I don't know if I have the power to do this because it's not expressly stated in the Constitution. And of course, as you will all know, the Republicans are about um, expressed or enumerated powers, a, a strict construction of the Constitution. But in order to purchase Louisiana, he's going to have to use the implied or loose uh, construction of the Constitution. So um, Jefferson decides to do it. Um, and I will tell you, the Federalists are, are very much opposed to the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory because this could take power away from the Federalists because all this new territory, of course, is going to be agricultural and farmers are Republicans. So he feared that Jefferson's vision of an agrarian society will be realized with the purchase of Louisiana. And Jefferson, of course, thought this was awesome. And so he just, he often referred to Louisiana as his valley of democracy. The independent yeoman farmer is going to finally have opportunities that they didn't have before. And so Louisiana is now ours. All right, guys, that's the end of this video. Um, we'll start with period four um, next week. Have a great weekend. Bye.